John chapter 21, and we'll begin reading in verse 15. John 21 and verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spake, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Now, Father, we pray that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Oh, how many times we have failed you. How many times we have been ashamed to speak your word. How many times, Lord, that we've even allowed others or in the presence of others and even ourselves have cursed or dishonored your name. Oh, Father. We come to you this morning as as guilty sinners, as people that you tell us to love love you with all of our heart, to love you as you love us. And Lord, the longer we live, the longer we realize just how impossible that is, how our shortcomings show up time and time again. And yet, Lord, how that we want to love you and how that we want to follow you, how that... uh, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Lord, we do thank you that we can come to you knowing that you love us and that you you desire our fellowship and that love relationship to be maintained day and night. And so, Father, this morning we pray that you would renew that relationship, that love, as we would, as you would ask us, do you love me? Oh, Lord, can we say, yes, Lord. We love you with all of our hearts. Bless now, we pray this morning as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, this is probably the most, or the most intimate, the most personal relationship or the the conversation the Lord has with anybody in all of Scripture. It's interesting how the Lord asks questions. You go back to Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you? The Lord knew where Adam was. But it's interesting how the Lord will bring you out and make you say the things that he wants to hear or or make you say things that you realize that he knows what you're what uh, uh, he knows what you're thinking. And so uh, who told you you were naked, Adam? And so right on down the line, he just stripped him of of all of his uh, of his of his uh, defenses. And here we see that the Lord does the same with Peter. It's almost like Peter knowing that he's been forgiven, but where does he stand now? Uh, he's walked on water. He's, he's fed 5,000. He's done all these different things that, uh, with the Lord. And now the one thing he has done, that he, how, can he, how can he raise to, the, the rise to such heights? How can he... You know, be on the mountaintop with the Lord and see the transfiguration and the glory of the Lord. And yet, within just a few short weeks, deny him three times. Have you ever had a time in your life where you just felt so worthless? Where you felt like you just had, where you had just done so little for the Lord or that really you were so out of sorts with the Lord that you really wonder if he could ever even use you again? Uh, I was reading 
Spurgeon's fainting spells. He, or it's a, it's a book he wrote to preachers, and one of the chapters is the pastor's fainting spells. And he talked about how that uh, many times a pastor can feel so worthless and so inept and so helpless and and worth doing anything besides serving the Lord or besides preaching or standing in front of people. And uh, I remember my home pastor growing up. He said, you know, sometimes I go before the pul- in the pulpit and I just feel so unworthy to even be preachers. You know, and so many of us, we feel that way uh, in life. And something, many times it's because we have not done something the Lord's told us to, or we have fallen flat on our faces and trying to serve the Lord, or we have just gotten out of sort to, uh, and by willfully disobeying Him, and now we're suffering the consequences. I remember uh, growing up, you know, your parents would, you know, go ahead and beat me, but don't talk to me. You know, just go ahead and give me the punishment, but let's don't talk. Uh, the talking is usually a lot worse than than the physical punishment or the, even the uh, or the judicial punishment. But here we see that the Lord now, after dealing with Peter, we've seen he's seen him at least three times, if not four. Uh, Matthew, Luke chapter twenty four, verse forty four, makes us think that he maybe saw him a fourth time and talked to him privately. But uh, here now, Peter's been forgiven. We know that uh, fellowship has been restored as far as eating together and fellowshipping together, and there are even miracles again. But still, that relationship is not totally back to what it should be. He's not restored totally yet. And as a result, there has to be a reckoning between him and the Lord. And the, the, notice now the Lord didn't come to Peter and say, now, Peter, you know you lied about me three times. You said you didn't know me three different times. And Peter, you didn't, um, uh, actually, you even cursed me. Remember that, Peter? Pretty bad stuff, isn't it? Peter, you are a coward. Yeah, you cut off the service here, but then you ran like a rabbit away from me. He didn't do any of that. He didn't shame, shame, shame. He didn't do that with Peter. And notice the Lord doesn't do that with us. The Lord, we already know if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do we know what sin is in the first place? It's because He speaks to us and we already know what it is. And here, Peter knew what his sin was. But the Lord didn't say, Peter, you did all these things and I'll make it right. Notice the Lord says, Peter, do you love me? And that's the one thing that God wants with us. He seeks a loving relationship with each one of us. Yes, he wants us to obey him. Yes, he wants us to follow him. But we can't follow him without loving him. He says, if you love me, he says, love me as, I have, as my father has loved you. So uh, as my father has loved me, so I have I loved you. Continue in my love. And that whole love chapter there in chapters 14 and 15 about I'm the way, the truth, the life, and I'm your friends. And if, you, if you're my friends, you'll walk with me. And so this was that relationship that he wanted to restore. And so it wasn't, yes, there were things that had to be corrected, but the main thing was that relationship that God wanted with his people and with his servant. And God wants that relationship with you. More than anything else, he wants your love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy, mo- uh, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. Isn't that the first commandment? And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's interesting how that vertical relationship and that horizontal relationship, or vertical is with God, horizontal is with men, is exactly what the Lord brings out here. And he brings it out in a love relationship. Peter, do you love me? That's vertical. Feed my sheep. That's horizontal. And so he's wanting to reestablish that ministry. He's wanting to reestablish that fellowship, that fellowship that just isn't for Peter, but flows through Peter and touches the lost and dying world. And so we see now that as he comes to Peter, uh, the breakfast is finished, and now Peter, by we see they're, they're walking because later on and uh, Peter turns around and sees John following him over in verse uh, 20. So actually, they uh, John doesn't tell us this, but after breakfast now, Peter gets up and starts walking with the Lord along the shore. And as Peter has now denied the Lord three times, notice now how the Lord doesn't accuse him of anything, 
but just brings out the flaws in Peter by a series of questions. Three times he denied him. Three times now. Peter, uh, Lord, I'm going to love you to death. I, I'm the one who's going to stand with you. I'll fight to the death with you. And he did just the opposite. So, okay, Peter, what went wrong? And let's get back into that loving relationship that we had with one another. So we see three inquiries. Three times the Lord's talking with him. You can imagine. Can you imagine walking with the Lord like this, knowing that everything isn't right, and just wondering what the Lord is going to say? I think this was sheer agony for Peter. It was one time where, oh my, I'd do anything if I could get out from being here now doing this with the Lord. And hey, I, I, if I was Peter, I'd say, oh, the rest of you guys come with me. I don't want to be alone with the Lord right now. You know, it would be one of those things. But here we have a one-on-one. And actually, that's what God does with you and with me. We could have a collective church service, and that's what we want to have because God tells us to gather together. But the one thing that we've got to do from our collective church uh, called out ones, the ecclesia, as we meet together, then we go and we've got to live our individual lives. And as a result, we want the Lord to speak to us. We want the Lord to be our personal Savior, our church Savior, but and not the preacher's Savior or my mother's Savior or my father's Savior, but my personal Savior, that He walks with me, He talks with me. He puts His strong and loving arms around me. That type of Savior. And so we see the Lord now has to deal with Peter one-on-one. And the first question, Peter, son of Jonah. It's interesting. The Lord goes back to Jonah's original name. He says, he doesn't say Peter. He says, Simon, son of Jonah. Now, if you go back and look in John chapter 1, he says, now, Peter, uh, he says, Simon, you will no longer be called Simon. Or he says, Simon, your name is no longer Simon, but it is Cephas, which is Hebrew for Peter, which is the stone, a stone or a rock. Now, he was a small stone. Petra was a small stone. And he says, upon this stone or this, uh, your, this rock that you have just stated, or this slab, this foundation, that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God, I will build my church. And so Peter wasn't the rock. He wasn't the foundation of the church. He was a rock that was going to be presenting. He was a rock on that church. He was a rock on this foundation of that church. Let's put it that way. And so we see now that he goes back to that, he says, Simon, son of Jonah. Let's go back to where we all began, Peter, where I first met you. It's interesting the Lord did that uh, with, uh, with Jacob also. Jacob, your name is going to be Israel, high and uh, lofty name. And yet we see the Lord calling him Jacob, and then calling him Israel several times interchangeably because Jacob still had his whole nature and he still tricked people. Abraham was changed from Abram to Abraham, but that was a covenant. That was a promise that could not be broken because God said you will become the father of many nations. Therefore, it was Abraham from then on. But with Jacob, it was more of a character issue. He was a friend of God and yet he was still the deceiver, wasn't he? And so we see him called Jacob one time. We see him called Israel at other times because of the, the war between the flesh and the spirit that Jacob had. And here we see the same way with, uh, with Peter. Simon, son of Jonah. And then the next thing he says, Simon, do you really love me? And here we have several plays, we see several plays on word here. The first one is this word, love. And that's, a, well, we know the word agape, and it's become pretty popular today. But the, the, the agape love was what the Greeks considered only the gods can have it. It was, only, it was a supernatural love. But this was exactly the word that John used in his description of God's love for us. For God so agape, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is a self-sacrificial love. It is an all-encompassing love. It's everything I have of value is your type of love. 
And then we see it two times in the Bible very explicitly. And that is, uh, God so loved the world that he gave. And what does the Bible tell the husband? All-encompassing love toward your wife in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, where he says, Husband, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, agape. You should be willing to give totally your wife. Yes, you've got responsibilities. It doesn't mean you're subservient to her. But whenever you say, honey, will you marry me? You are making a total commitment to her for life. And so does that not bring value up to a higher level? Does our marriage up to a higher level? And so we see that uh, this was the type of love that God was asking Peter, Peter, do you, you said you love me. And you said you were willing to die for me. Peter, do you love me? And then notice he says, more than these. More than what? More than boats and fishing? More than going back to your old life? More than the world? More than these other disciples? You said you love me and you'd be the one that would stick with me more than the rest of them. Um, Peter, do you love me more than these? And we see... Peter's response. And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, the word that he's changed here is the word that we get, Philadelphia, a city of brotherly love, phileo. Uh, he says, yes, Lord, I love you. It's a very passionate love. You can have a very passionate love for a friend or for a girlfriend. And all these songs are written about love in, America, in the United States by guides who have been married or, uh, you know, have 10 girls on a string. You know, I love you to the day I die. You well, till the next one comes along or whatever. You know, that's, a, that's the phileo type of love. Not a total commitment. Not a self-sacrificial love. Yes, it, the love as long as, you know, it benefits me or so long. And if anybody, uh, if any girl comes to me and says, okay, my vows are going to be changed from till death do us part, to so long as love shall last, I'll say, forget it. I don't, we're not, I'm not going to marry somebody like that because love should, so, so love, love is more than an emotion. It's a decision. It's a commitment. It's a work. It's a, it's a total giving of oneself. That, that's the idea of agape love. The philo love is, is used interchangeably because it is passionate at times. But here we see that the John is definitely changing or he's, he's distinguishing between the two. Do, are, are we to love the Lord at times? Do we have a real passion for him? Yes. And yet uh, times we, you know, they're, they're varying, the times we have varying passions, varying uh, uh, levels of passion for the Lord. We know that. And so Peter says, Lord, you know, that I love you. Notice also that he left out more than these. He didn't, you know, Lord, you know I love you. And uh, don't ask me about the crazy things I've said about loving you more than the rest of the disciples or, you know, I'm back to fishing. How can I say that I love you more than that now? Uh, how can I say that I love you more than the old life? <laughs> you caught me in it. I mean, no defense. I mean, I'm stripped bare, Lord. Have mercy on I me. Mean, don't say any, you know, don't ask me. You know, just one of those things where God is, is dealing with him and it's just cutting him to the heart. So they walk a little bit farther along. And you can imagine Peter's just standing there saying, okay, what's next? And our Lord again says, Peter, do you love me? And it's the same word, same phrase. Lord, Lord, uh, well, let's go back. First of all, the Lord says to him, feed my lambs. In other words, Peter, get back to the simple things of just feeding uh, <clears throat> the beginners. Go back to your beginner work where you just helped people. But now, Peter, do you love me? And those, again, he goes back to the stone or to the, to the rock. And uh, he says, blessed, and this again, he says, I say it no longer to you, are you the, uh, uh, just Simon, but now you are a rock. But he says, do you love me, agape? And Peter again says, Lord, you know, intellectually, and again, notice the word, you know, that's going to change again. Lord, you know, I love you. 
You intellectually, Lord, you know I love you. You know I care about you. You know that I've had a great passion for you. We've had our ups and downs. We've been, we've been, yes, I've loved you almost as a brother. I mean, that's what else can I say, Lord? I, I love you. I, I care. You're, you're, my, you're my friend. You tell me you want if I'm, I'm your friend. But I can't say that word, agape. I mean, I, how can I with what I've done? You notice, the Lord says to him again. He says, tend my sheep or shepherd my sheep. Now, that's a very interesting thing because what the Lord is doing is saying, now, Peter, don't give up. Let's get started all over again. Let's go back to where I told you you're going to be a disciple and you're going to be a fisher of men. And we see over in Second Peter or in First Peter chapter, uh, we see that Peter brings these things out. He says, and as far as uh, feeding his lambs, he says that uh, that we that I want to feed you. The, the, and I hope that you desire the sincere milk of the word. Now, in the second time, we tell we see that he talks to disciples and people that are that are leaders in the church, and he tells them to shepherd the flocks of God. He tells them not to, for vainglory and not for self-aggrandizement, not for riches and not for power or esteem, but do it sacrificially. Feed my sheep. Shepherd my sheep. And if you really love me, you'll be giving yourself to others. If you really love me, we know that we've passed from death into life because we love, we agape the brethren. He that loveth not the brethren abideth in death. So John later on wrote that. And so again, as Christians, we are to be very giving people. We are to be very self-sacrificial type of people. There is that labor of agape, that toil of love in our lives. And notice how the Lord says to Peter, get up, Peter, and tend my sheep. Now, still one more time, though. Peter's still walking along, and he's saying, how can I do that? How can I... Really, the dam hasn't burst yet. He's still saying, okay, Lord, you're telling me these things, but I'm still in a turmoil inside. You know, you have, you know that I love you. And then we see the Lord saying one more time, and Peter getting very upset. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape, or excuse me, this time he changes it Peter, do you really follow me? Do you really love me even as a friend? So he comes down to Peter's level. And Peter says, and Peter gets all upset and he's grieved because the Lord's asked him the third time. And he's come down now to a level that uh, is what Peter has been saying all along. And he says, Lord, you know, and the word know there is another is a change. Instead of just intellectual knowledge, Lord, you know by experience. You know by the way I've treated you. You know by the things that have happened in the past few days. You know by experience that I cannot say I agape, that I love you with all my heart. You know that. You know all things. And I'm laid bare before you. And I can't say that I love you. I feel so disgrace to even be in your presence. And you're asking me, do I really love you? I don't know, Lord. I don't, I don't even know what love is after all this. My emotions are so torn up inside me, I can't figure it out, even in my own life. You ever been there? You ever been where you just don't know you're standing with other people, let alone the Lord? You feel so worthless and helpless? You feel like such a failure because you just haven't measured up to what you should have been. Peter's there, and the Lord's dealing with him. And the Lord wants more than anything else our love. Yes, we fail him. Yes, there are times in our life where, where yeah, and that's the thing that should grieve us the most, is not, oh, Lord, you're going to beat me to death if I do that. That's not what God wants. That's not what I wanted with my own children. 
I didn't want my children to think, oh my, if uh, if I do this, then my dad's going to beat me to within an inch of my life, which I don't think, I hope they would never have to fear that. But, uh, you know, I don't want that any, I don't want the, the people, my children to think that. I would much rather for them to think, you know, if I do this, this is just going to just about kill my mom and dad. Wouldn't that be a better way of worrying about it? I love my mom and dad so much, I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to hurt them. And I can't do this. Well, isn't that the way it should be with the Lord? Oh, if I do this, the Lord will strike me dead. That's not what God wants. Although there should be a good fear there that God has complete control over us. But if I do this, that this is going to wreck my relationship with my Lord and with my God. My hour, my time of sweet prayer with him, my time of fellowship with him as he walks with me and talks with me and he tells me I am his own. All these things I want in my life. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow. Lead me to Calvary. Well, we sing songs like that, but yet we, we walk so far away from it and we feel so worthless. But then when the Lord starts dealing with us, the Lord doesn't want us to think about the consequences. Now, yes, there will be consequences if we fall into deep sin. But really, the relationship isn't restored until the Lord says, get up. In spite of what you've done, the reason I left you on earth is to follow me. No matter what you've done in your past, get up. I've left you on earth here for a purpose. I've left you here so that you and I can establish a relationship where even others will see my grace and my mercy upon a life like yours. In other words, God is saying, I want to make you a trophy of my grace. Yes, you've done some pretty wretched things, but I want to show to a lost and dying world what I can do with those will come to me. Get up. Follow me. So he says the third time, Peter, get back to what I tell you to do, and that is feed my lambs. And so we see the Lord, or feed my sheep. And so we see now that now Peter is laid bare. And the Lord says, now, Peter, feed my sheep. Then in verse 18, Peter, um, I'll take what you've said. You've been very honest with me. I appreciate that. You've told me that you only like me or with passionately love me, but not that sacrificial love. But I'll take that at the moment. As long as you'll follow me, Peter, you'll grow in that love. And it'll get to the point in your life, Peter, where you will be willing to give your all for me. The Lord takes you where you are, where even where you can't admit what you want to be. But if you'll follow him, that love grows, and it grows into a total commitment. And that's exactly what the Lord tells Peter here. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, Peter, in verse 18, that when you were younger, you were you girded about, you walked about, the, you were a pretty impetuous type of fellow. You walked about where you wanted uh, and you did what you wanted to do. Yes, you followed me, but uh, so many times I had to pull you back or pull you along. I mean, you were kind of a wild type of guy trying to, to, to rein in. But you know, I loved you then, and I love you now. But there's coming a time, Peter, when you're going to get older, and they're going to stretch out your hands, and you're going to be crucified just like I was. And the Lord says... Uh, uh, and John explains that. He says, this is signifying the type of death that uh, Peter would die for the glory of God. And so the Lord told Peter, now, as he re- reinstates him, that Peter, one day you're going to die just like I did. You're going to be crucified. Now, how would you like to live with that type of, of prediction for your life, for the rest of your life, knowing that one day you're going to die one of the most uh, horrible deaths ever known to man? And so the Lord was very honest with Peter. And yet we notice that uh, just in a, just a few short days, 
that Peter was standing in front of thousands of people and 3,000 people got saved. He went to the temple and they beat on him. And he re- left the temple rejoicing that he was even worthy to, be, uh, to suffer humiliation for the Lord Jesus Christ. What a change in his life. How did God recommission this man and got him growing in the Lord? And as a result, notice what he says. He says uh, now in verse uh, 20, he says, now I've told you, he, said, he says to him the same thing he said at the very beginning. First time he ever saw Peter, he said, follow me. Now, as he picks Peter up and gets and brushes him off, and he feeds him, as he reestablishes him, he says, follow me. What else can we do besides follow the Lord? What else can we do other than say, yes, Lord, you know my shortcomings. You know that I don't have a perfect love. You know my imperfection. You know my weaknesses. You know how that I've denied you time and time again. You know how I failed you, but Lord, I want to serve you. I want to be what you want me to be. And Lord, I want to follow you. I like what someone said. Lord, I there's so many things in my life that that I'm willing, you know, I'm not even sure I'm willing. But in following you, I'm willing to be made willing. To follow you. I'm willing, Lord, what do I do with these boats? What do I do with my friends? What do I do with my family? What, my wife, she's still out there, you know? What do I do with all this? And the Lord says, follow me, and everything else will fall into place. Everything else, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and what else? All these things shall be added unto you. They'll fall into place. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. I'll get you. The word rest there is not just I'll, I'll put you in a flower bed of ease. No, I'll give you, I'll get you in timing with me. And the biblical rest is when you're ticking with God. It's like a, a car when we used to tune them up. They say it's purring like a kitchen, a kitten. You know, it's an idea of in line with the Lord. A train can run off track for a while. But it sure runs a whole lot better when it's on track, doesn't it? And the Lord says, I'll put you back on track. I'll get you clicking. I'll get that clickety-clack going again in your life. Just be willing. If you wait until you can say with all of your heart that you love me and you're going to follow me, you'll never do it. Start where you are and let's proceed from there. Oh, Lord, if I can just straighten out my life, I'll serve. No, no, no. Do it now. Lord, whatever you want, wherever you lead me, I'll follow. Lord, you know I'm not willing in a lot of areas, but Lord, I'm willing to be made well. I'm not willing to be crucified, Lord. But no, I'm willing to do what you tell me to do day after day and with each passing moment. That's all God expects. And he will give you the grace. Aren't you glad that... uh, God doesn't tell you what he's going to do five or a month from now in your life. Some of us might be very happy. Most of us would be scared to death. But I do know, based on past experience, and there's that word knowledge again, one is that I know mentally, but also know by past experience that whatever God, where God leads me, he will always supply, he will always meet the needs. He goes before me, and that I know that, that thanks be to God, which giveth us the what? Victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that by experience. Why? Because I've done it. Now, am I going to fall in the future? I'm scared to death of the future, folks, sometimes. I mean, you look at all the things going on. I had uh, uh, someone call me just yesterday and just was concerned about the world going to pieces. I said, you should have been with us on Wednesday night. We've been looking at it. Psalm 46, 47, 48, you know, all these things. And how that the God has promised that he will never leave us or forsake us and that he will meet our needs. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. What? All I have to do is follow. I'll take you where you are and I'll lead you where I want you to go if you'll follow me. 
That's all God asks. If you're not saved, you say, well, I'll clean up my life and then I'll ask the Lord to save me and I'll become a Christian. You'll never do it because you'll never get good enough because you don't even know how bad you are. The one thing that uh, is wrong with me is that the older I get and the more experienced I am as a Christian, the more I realize what I was. And the things that I didn't even know were bad, now I look at and say, how did the Lord, why didn't you convict me of that then? Because I wasn't ready. And aren't you glad that God does that with you too? Because the Lord knows. Just He'll take you where you are and He'll lead you where He wants you to go. Just He'll take it if you tell Him you love Him. How imperfect that love is. Just love Him. And it would be amazing what He does in developing that love for Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank you for what it can do in changing our lives. And Lord, may we be able to say, and so many times, if we're truly honest, we cannot say, I love you with all my heart, because our heart is so deceitfully and desperately wicked. So many times we let the little things get in the way of really serving you and loving you. So many times we let human relationships and and the cares of this life and the lusts of the flesh get in the way of loving you. Oh, Lord, may we love you more than these. May we love you more than anything that life has to offer because you are life. And we know that you give us the abundant life as we would serve you. Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray that as we love you with a very imperfect love, that you can take us where we are and take us to where you want us to be in the center of your will, that we may truly say, I love you, Lord, with all my heart. And that one day you can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Bless your people now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's